Hi everybody and welcome to Draw in Color. It's the second Tuesday of the month. So um, let's see, we're doing the Shy Tulip project tonight. Um, super excited about that. Um, just because, oh, hold on, I got an ad coming up here. I don't know why YouTube wants to feed me ads during my own live stream. Um, and it's not like the ad that you guys are watching. It just like comes across the bottom about things that I can upgrade to. Why? This is not the time that I want to be thinking about that. <laughs> okay, so um, Shy Tulip tonight. I live in Michigan, so I am in the great north, I guess you might say. Um, and this is really the first warm day that we've had. So I'm drawing tulips tonight because I'm very eager for tulip seasons to start. We don't have any tulips going here yet. And I know a lot of my Southern students here are probably like, oh, my tulips are dying. But we had snow last week. So um, this is me kind of forcing spring here. And Tonight we're working with pink and I don't know, like I've avoided pink for years and some of you are probably like laughing at the fact that I'm working with pink like this, this much, but it just, it's just kind of fallen into that. I was inspired by, let me pull up our photo reference there. So it's not the pink that I was going for. If you look up on the points of the tulips, that's what I was going for. See that purple that's in there? I was really interested in that. So that's what inspired it. And then I found that I had kind of dug myself a hole because, well, we're going to talk about it tonight. As we're talking about um, things that go into making realistic tulips or realistic flowers, I think most people when you think flowers and Copic, you grab your pink markers. And pink is just, oh, if there's one thing that has me wanting to switch brands of markers, it's the Copic selection of pinks. They are, there's so many that are fluorescent. And then if they're not fluorescent, then they're slightly dirty. And so I have a really hard time coming up with pink combinations. So we'll talk about that just in a little bit, but at first I wanted to um, just make sure that, um, if you're joining me for the very first time, my name is Amy Schulke. I'm an artist and art instructor. Um, I'm a technical illustrator. Uh, thank you, Kenny, for letting me know that the sound was working properly. That's always reassuring. <laughs> so um, I've been teaching Copic solidly for 10 years straight now. Um, I'm kind of coming back to YouTube. I haven't been on YouTube in a long time. I started out, it didn't go anywhere. Um, and I'm kind of like coming back to it now as an effort to make sure that people get more free education. So that's what this drawing color is tonight. Um, but I've been using markers for like 30 years, so I'm not new to this um, and I do it different than your average marker person because I'm coming at it from a fine arts background. So as you watch me tonight, some of the things may be just a little bit different and um, go ahead and feel free to ask questions about that either in the live comment section or, you know, you can leave a comment if you're watching the recording down below. Um, I'm still small enough that I can read all the comments and I try to answer everything. So you can ask me a question there if what I'm doing, the techniques that I'm using don't seem familiar to you or you just want to know why I do it backwards or upside down. Um, because I really do do things flip-flopped in a lot of ways. I didn't realize that when I started, but that's that's how it is. All right, so tonight um, there is a worksheet that goes with this class. Um, I have been, I've been including these in the digital stamp package. So tonight I'm going to draw a tulip. It'll get turned into a digital stamp so that you can color along with the video replay. And included in that is going to be this worksheet that gives you some of those colors to shoot for. Um, also, if you are a subscriber to my newsletter, then you can get this. It's always included in the free digital download library. So that's two ways to get the worksheet. Um, let's see, my sketchbook tonight is the Stillman and Bernzetta, and we have just been slowly working through this book. Um, it is okay for pencils and it's okay for markers. I'm not gonna rave about it for either one. This was just a little scribbling that I did. Um, I'm skipping pages just because I'm absent-minded when I'm coloring. Um, there's not a lot of color that comes through on those previous pages. 
Um, it, it like starts to soak through, but it doesn't soak through onto the other page. But even so, I have a um, blacker sheet that um, will protect the page below. So wh where you see that I've skipped a page, it's just because I was talking and wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing. So this is the Stillman and Burn Zeta, and I know some people like to see exactly what those products look like. So that's what it looks like when you find it on uh, store shelves. Honestly, though, I have only seen these books on the shelf in a Barnes and Noble. That's the only place that I've seen them. I have not seen them in my local art store. I've not seen them. Um, I, it's been a long time since I've been into Hobby Lobby, um, and I don't have a Joann's or a Michael's close. I live out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I've not seen them on the shelves at craft stores, but maybe you have. I ordered mine from Amazon as in, it's a brand that I've been using for a while. Um, and the Zeta works pretty good for this kind of mixed media that I do. So there's more information on that on the resource page. I've linked to the resource page up at the top of the chat here. So I'm working on the Stillman and Burn, but if you don't want to work in a notebook, that's fine. Um, Express It is my recommended paper if you're focused on Copics. So if you do most of your work with Copic and only a little bit of work with the colored pencil, then the Express It is the best paper that I recommend for beginners through advanced because it's just, it's a self-blending paper. So it just really, really works well with um, Copic markers. Now, because we do mixed media, the Copics really like smooth paper with no tooth. Colored pencil like paper with tooth. So you kind of have to find a happy medium. And Express It does not allow a lot of colored pencil on top of it. Just a little bit too smooth. That's why it's the good marker paper, but not necessarily good for colored pencil. You can get a couple of layers on there, but probably not more than three. So if you're gonna be doing my process and you don't wanna do the Stillman and Burn, then I do recommend um, the Strathmore Bristol in the Smooth Finish. Now, Strathmore comes in, um, let's see, this is the 300 level. There's a 400 level that has a brown cover. It's a little bit more expensive. And then there's a five, 500 level that's white. The, the 300 is the cheapest and I actually like it the best, which is unusual for me because if you give me, if you blindfold me and ask me to taste five types of chocolate, I'll tell you which one's the most expensive. So it's amazing that I actually like the yellow best, but I think it's just because it's a little toothier for the colored pencil. It's a very good paper. It takes a lot of colored or it takes a lot of marker. Um, it, it meaning that it's a little bit thirsty, so it takes more than the express it, but I really like that. And if you want a sample of what something looks like on Strathmore, just grabbing into my recent projects here. So this is the um, Easter egg project, which was last month for my advanced group. And just to double check, I always write on the back. So that's STR for Strathmore 300. So this is what I use for photorealism. So I'm not recommending a cheap paper just because it's cheap. I'm recommending it because I really like it and I really work on it a lot. So those are the papers that you can use for the project. I mean, honestly, you can use anything that you really want, but you're going to get better results on bettered paper. So, um, yeah, somebody just asked, Sheila is asking, coloring along with the replay, I'll come back then. Well, yep, you could do that. Um, I color fast, so it's not like you could stop and pause and go and then, you know, look at what I'm doing and then do it on your own. Um, remember, I've been doing this for 30 years, so color along with me is not necessarily me. It's definitely not me saying, okay, now pull out your green marker and we're going to do this and this. Um yeah, that's kind of the instruction that I do in classes, in the online classes. It's not really what I was shooting for um, in the live streams, though. I have a feeling that a lot of people are watching just for the entertainment value of it. So um, that is what I had planned tonight, is just to super fast sketch something out, and then it'll turn into a digital stamp, and it'll be available later, on later this week, probably. Although, I do have two live streams this weekend, so... Hmm. Yeah, might be early next week if I'm being honest with myself. All right, so that photo reference is um, right there on the worksheet and it is a full tulip 
and I was a little bit nervous because back when we did the um, the lollipop, shouldn't bang things on the desk like that. See, I did good with the carrot really filling up the page there. Um, but when it came time to the lollipop, I mean, that's kind of squinchy down into the, like I needed the heart to be up here in the, the stem longer. And I want what I do tonight to really resemble the um, digital stamp. So, <clears throat> so I kind of um, cheated a bit and gave myself a couple of extra lines here. So this is just, I'm going to plan to do the leaf here and the stem here. And I was just drawing a little cutoff line because it's hard to talk and draw at the same time. <laughs> so I'm going to pop that one up in the corner, um, but that one's too small for me to use as a reference. When I go to um, draw, you'll see me looking like right now I am looking at a photo of just the, um, the head of the tulip. So I'm looking at just that over on my screen. So when you see me looking there, and a lot of students do look to see how often I'm looking at my paper versus how often I'm looking at my photo reference. And then dead center here, I have the full tulip. So you're gonna see me glance up and look at things that are not necessarily on camera, but I am orienting, orienting myself, making sure that I'm drawing the lines the way I want them to be. So I have those nice and big so that I can see them. This is just regular HB lead in my mechanical pencil. And I have the Tombow Mono Knock eraser here. And if I'm good, if I'm a good girl, I will use um, a, uh, what are these? Um, hockey brushes, hake, hockey. Not sure how that's pronounced in Japanese, but this is just a cheap, inexpensive, um, I think this was like $4. So relatively inexpensive the way brushes are priced nowadays. Um, the Japanese use these for flooding an area with ink, but we use them for um, dusting or you know, getting rid of the eraser shavings or getting rid of the pencil dust that accrues. Because if you'd use the side of your hand, which I'm bad and I do that all the time, <sighs> um, you can accidentally color on your paper by dragging that colored pencil dust across the paper. So in an ideal world, I'm always dusting like that. So if that's what you see flittering across the screen, that's what's going on there. Okay, so as I said, I gave myself kind of this line right here. I might refine that a little bit. I'm not sure, that's gonna be the leaf right here. And then I wanted the tulip to sit kind of in the corner here. I'm kind of looking I didn't like do any measurements for this. I did it like a couple minutes before the live stream started because I was like, oh yeah, I don't want to be embarrassed about that. Um, so, okay, so if this is that far from the corner, I think I want to shorten this up a bit and maybe end my tulip right there. And then there's going to be a leaf that comes up that way as well. All right, so I'm just kind of planning it out and now I need to mouse over and get my photo up. Oh, Nancy says she wants to point out how much she loves and actually, here we go. I can put these up on the screen now if I get rid of that Stillman and Burn. <laughs> here we go. Nancy's pointing out that she really likes the um, pencil. I do too. It's got this really squishy gel grip here and it is the Uni alpha gel and I'm using a 0 0.5 and it's just regular HB lead. It's nothing fancy. Um, I don't do a lot of those um, pencil sketches where there's a ton of detail to it. So I don't have a need to buy all those different softness of pencils. Um, basically I sketch and then I erase my sketch and then Copic over the top of it. So for that, just regular little HB is fine. You don't have to invest and a big set of drawing pencils. All right, so I'm looking at the head. I'm trying to orient my picture the same way it is on the screen. I've got it laying down on its side. Um, and I'm looking at the bottom of the tulip and there's gonna be like a an oval shape there so that the tulip comes down. Yeah, I like that. All right. And then there's this vein in the tulip in the center petal. 
Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so there's a there's a center petal here, and there's a there's a crease in the center of that petal, and if you follow that line, it goes straight down into the stem. Huh. Okay. So I'm just gonna keep that line because that's gonna be the center of my petal there. Okay, that works. All right. So I'm gonna make my stem about that thickness. And then there's an oval there, and that kind of comes up into that. See, I just wiped that away with my hand. Bad. I used to be really good about it, but now when I'm in a hurry, it's just... The worst thing you can do, though, is blow. Don't blow your eraser dust because every time you try it, you're gonna blow a little bit of spit. Gross, but true. All right, so if I were that petal, that's kind of where I'd be. And it kind of comes down there. Yeah. All right, so branching off from that stem, Two petals that come up, that kind of come out to maybe there. Probably more up. That's going to join with the bottom of my oval there. Get rid of those guidelines. Now this one. Oop, that was my eraser. You know what? Normally I have the green one out because that way I can tell the difference between my pencil and my eraser. There we go. Kind of like that. All right, let me all right, so coming up there. Just a little petal that we're seeing back there, but I like it. Adds a little bit of depth there. And then down at the bottom, I have a couple of little, because we're seeing through to the opposite side there. So I'm pretty good with that. All right, so we kind of have a line going that way. I'm not going to do the leaf that's over here because it bothers me that there's three leaves and three main petals. So I don't want them to be too matchy matchy. Come up and do that right angle. And I'm going to extend that just a little bit.
here we go. And now I'm thinking I this kind of grew a little farther than I wanted it to, so I'm going to bring that one down. Nice rounded base on it. All right, grabbing my poster putty. I know it looks like gray, a gray kneaded eraser, but this is actually sticky tack that um, goes on the wall. Um, it's what you use to adhere posters. And um, I use it because it is stronger than the gray erasers. The gray erasers are meant for graphite, which is exactly what I'm using it for this for right now. Um, but they're not strong enough to lift colored pencil. So over the years, I've just been using sticky tack because it is stronger and will lift up the nice waxy colored pencil pigment. Um, and then I just stopped buying the gray erasers because I don't want to keep track of having multiple erasers, some that work on colored pencil and some that don't. And I'm feeling like this is all really cramped. Like I like the elegant long stem. So I think when I do the, the digital stamp, I'm going to I'm going to lengthen the stamp, the, the stem here. Yeah, definitely going to do that. But tonight I'll color exactly what I've done here because I don't want to redraw. I hate that. By the way, I got attacked or actually I attacked um, some blackberry bushes. So this is what you have seen on my hands and, it even got my face. <laughs> I was waiting for the the season. <laughs> Esther says, I'm glad you show the drying process. It's interesting to watch. Not a lot of people show the drying process because I think a lot of people work with stamps. Um, so I figured it was something that I could do that was different. Um, Jackie says, I love using them for the colored pencil plus. The, um, the hockey brush or the eraser probably. Okay, so usually I pick out pink live on camera. Um, today I knew that it was going to be a, um, a tough one. So I'm just going to explain why I've picked the pinks that I picked. Okay, so you almost never see me using anything that starts with a zero. So RV04, anything that has that zero in the front, like YG03 is an exception, but for the most part, the markers, the Copic markers that start with that zero, those are pure saturated hues. And um, they're a little too bright. It's not that the colors are bad. It's that some of them are slightly fluorescent and some of them are, um, they're just, super strong, super intense. Um, they remind me of like birthday party colors. So you don't see me using them a lot because they require quite a lot of underpaint. And um, it's just, they're too bright for my taste. That doesn't mean that I never use them. I'm going to be using this RO for tonight, but the natural inclination is to just grab all of one number family. So you might grab the RV02, the 04, the 06, the 08. Um, and that was too much brightness in the darker areas of the pink. I was seeing this R55 and I'm seeing some underpaint underneath there to make a slightly more purpley color. And so actually what I was thinking was originally V20 underneath the RV55. But here's the thing. I don't underpaint flowers because it makes them look super heavy. So that's going to be one of the things that um, one of the points that we talk about more. Um, but I am keeping this violet kind of in mind and I will use it on the leaf. So I'm going to go RV55 because that's the color that I see in the darker pink. And then the RV04 is there because I could not find anything to blend with the RV55 that was in between the 55 and what's the next one down? Um, 52. Yeah. RV52, this is a big jump from an RV55 to a 52. So I slid this RV04 in there because they're all kind of blue-based pinks. And then I ended up just kind of getting rid of the 02, or, or the 52 rather. So my combination here is 
this right here, RV55, RV04, RV63. And they do go down here, so that's a five, a four, and a three. So they're going down, they follow the rules there. They're all blue-based pinks and they blend pretty nicely together. And I think that the reason why I ch chose the RV63 is because it's toning down the fluorescence on this 04. I hope I'm explaining this right. And then when I put a highlight on flowers, I almost always go for something slightly warmer. So I threw in the RV10 because this is more of a warm pink, whereas these guys are cooler. So this is my combination that I'm going to be coloring with. And then this V20 is the color that I want, but it's going to come over the top of the RV55 because when you underpaint a flower petal, it makes it look like it's an inch thick. Underpainting adds weight to things. It adds presence to things. It adds that natural shade and shadow, but you don't want that on flowers. You want flowers to look light and delicate and thin and silky. So um, the underpainting I find is just too heavy for most flowers. So this color is going to get introduced again later. Not this marker, but this color is what I'm shooting for. So I usually start with the flower heads because I figure that the leaves, when I'm teaching, I teach with the leaves first, okay? Because I figure that the leaves are just a warm up. But when I'm working on my own, I do the flower first because if I mess up on the flower, then I haven't invested 30 minutes on the leaves. It's just, it's, it's an easy way to throw away your illustration and start over when you know that you need to. So tonight I'm going to work the way I normally work. When I'm teaching though, you kind of need a warm up. You need a, something that everybody's familiar with. So that's why we start with the leaves when I, in my classes. All right, so the first thing that we talked about there is the RV problem. The, the pinks, they're, there's a lot that have like a glowing kind of aspect to them. Um, and then the, the other ones are dirty. So something like an RV 90, it's just a dirty color. And I wish I could just go into the Copic factory and rearrange all their pinks and add some new ones in there um, because they just don't make the pinks that I want. Same with the yellows. I have the same problem with the yellows too. They don't make enough and they don't make the right colors that I find that I need. So I struggle to pick them out. So that's the first problem thing that you kind of have to get over with flowers. The next thing is that underpaint warning. So um, what we normally do in my classes is you probably have like a, well, we wouldn't be doing it with a flower, but we might underpaint with the violet there and then the pink goes over the top of that and that's creating the color that I see in the photo reference. See how fluorescent that looks? I mean, ugh. this does dry back better. That 63 kind of helps to tone down the fluorescence. So that's pretty much a petal that's kind of like what we want. But the thing is, is that presence of the purple in this area here is adding like a definite weight to the flower right down there. And I find that it's just too heavy. So I usually do the um, underpainting as overpaint with pencils. So if you're doing a flower like, hmm, Violets have thick petals. Um, succulent comes to mind, but that's not actually a flower. It's like it doesn't have the bloom there. Those are the leaves. Um, if I'm doing a succulent, I'm underpainting because you want that to be nice and heavy and um, solid looking. But if I'm doing something delicate like these these um, tulip leaves, I don't really want that heaviness there. The third thing, and it's the problem that a lot of people do, is that... Um, you're looking at that flower and it's not as smooth as you want it to be because we want flower petals to be so silky smooth, no flick strokes showing, everything perfectly blended. And you end up drowning the flower 
petal with ink. And that adds visual weight and heaviness to it. So that's the other thing that you want to avoid. And then the last thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we get down into the stem here, is that people tend to have this, and I call it silk flower syndrome. You tend to think of that stem as being like the little plastic piece that inserts up into the blossom. Um, and that's not really true. When you look at the bottom, that's why we're doing this tulip, pointing its head away from us so we can really visualize that area of the stem there. The stem, those, those petals grow from the stem. They don't grow on the stem and there's nobody that like glued them onto the stem they grow naturally out of that stem. And so what you, I want you to avoid is just dead stopping your green right at the bottom of the flower and then dead stopping your pink right at the bottom of the blossom. There's gonna be a pigment exchange. So some of that green comes up into the petals and some of that pink is gonna come down into the stem and it helps unify them. If you are doing Let's say you're doing four tulips in a row and you've got a red one and a yellow one and an orange one and a white one. You And let's say I cut the heads off of them so that I separated all the blossoms from all the stems. You should still be able to point to each one of those stems and say that's the one that belongs to the red blossom because it has red in the stem. And that's the one that belongs to the orange one because it has orange in the stem. So this stem, the way I color it tonight, should only belong to this pink flower. It shouldn't look right if you were to just graft it onto a purple tulip. You want that to look like it's a solid, co cohesive piece that's fully connected. And this is true not just for tulips, although I do this lesson a lot with tulips because it's easy to see. But this same thing also happens with daisies. And with every other flower imaginable, they all are more connected to that stem than the way that we color them. And I think it's because in kindergarten, you know, you started drawing these or coloring these flowers that the um, teacher gives you where the flower comes down and hangs over the stem. And so you're just kind of used to cutting that green off. But that green really does need to leak up into the bottom of those petals for maximum realism. All right, so I'm kind of looking got that V and a lighter version of this V20 is actually BV00. It's a quad zero. So four zeros there. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the base where the stem connects up into the white petals. And I want to give myself just a little bit of the color right there. And I know that Jody said earlier um, that she could see the pencil lines, but then when I when I erased it, she couldn't see the pencil lines anymore. I kind of have to do it that way because um, Copic has some um, shellac in the formula. So if you don't erase your lines, they're going to be in there permanently bonded to the paper as soon as you color over them. And I would like to be able to take photos of this um, without having those lines showing. So I'm just kind of, the only reason why I'm doing this is because it's white down here and there's, there just wouldn't be any color there whatsoever. But I'm not going up any higher than that and I'm really being careful. That may have been too much. We'll have to see. All right, so what shall I start with? I think we'll start in the center. And I need to really kick myself so that I don't bring this color down too far. So I've got the RV55 here. I am terrible. I'll put that there, but chances are I'll knock it out of the way. So what I'm looking for is where the pink is darkest. And I'm taking advantage of that um, central vein that runs down the center of the petal there 
because it's kind of forming a natural half and half of the petal there. So I can do this half and then that half. Here comes that fluorescent color. I always color dark to light. Because once upon a time, when we were given marker classes, we used to always color light to dark or dark to light. The light to dark thing didn't appear for quite a quite a quite some time. But back when I had marker classes, everything was dark to light. And I'm trying to cut that pink off. So this is that RV10 that goes. It, I'm not going all the way down to the bottom there. All right. So that's one side. There's a wrinkle in the petal right there. And then there's kind of a A little divot there. So that was the 55. Here comes that 06 and it's that violently neon color. Sorry, not 06, this is 04. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm mapping the darks mentally figuring out where those go and then layering the inks over the those dark zones and then that figures that does the thinking for me so that I don't have to worry about where the blend starts and stops it all is based on that early calculation with the darks there so now I've got a petal that has kind of a low spot here. It rises a bit and then plunges right there in the center. And then it kind of rises a little bit and then plunges again. So there's already a little wrinkle in there for me. All right, let's do this one here. Back with that 55. correct some of my lines there. I don't love how that was done. And I'm running my lines. My flick strokes are running mostly in the direction of the veins of the petal.
So that's why it's kind of got that swerve going on there. I fear I may have come down a little bit too far on that one. Turn it. And I'm not trying to get every detail with the marker because I know I'm definitely coming back. I can add more detail with a colored pencil. Oop, not the chisel nib this time. I'm going to come along and get that right there. I'm going to do most of that detail with my colored pencils. But I'll do it really lightly right there for now. Whew, that is bright there. Not loving that. Mm, Copic pinks. You know, I'm doing all these pink classes and then I won't touch pink again for another three years. <laughs> I'm not the biggest pink fan to begin with. I just, everything that I've wanted to teach has kind of fallen in, into my lap being a, a pink image. So just kind of finding those dark areas. I may regret this fluorescent pink. But I went through, I've got all of the Copic RVs and I went through and I just couldn't find another one that fit value wise in between the 55 and what I thought was going to be using the, the 52. Should have tested it out on a piece of paper. Okay, I can already see that I have an error here that it needs to go darker here, but that's something that I can easily do with a colored pencil. Just kind of bringing that color down. And then switching over to the RV10. All in all, I didn't do too badly. I did leave a bit of a white gap there. There'll be more when I um, add the colored pencil over the top because I can rescue some of that with the white colored pencil. All right. Oh, I still have that one little petal over here. Can't forget that one.
So there we go. That one's kind of tilted back there. Okay, switching over to that stem. So I'm going to, because the stem is thick, I'm going to underpaint with that. And that's where that V20 is going to come in. Um, and I don't want to do, like, I, I knew that that RV04 was going to be bright. And so I didn't want to do my usual green um, combination, which is usually um, YG17 and YG03, which makes a very bright spring green. So I just grabbed the, um, the YG60s as a, a bit of a change. I don't know how much of the 67 I'll use, but I'm definitely going to use the 63 and the 61. But I still want that kind of hint of yellow. So my blending combination here is going to be V20 underpaint, YG67, maybe, YG63, YG61, and Y11. Move my pencil out of the way. All right, so I want that underpaint. Okay, so there's purple right up there at the top. And then, oh, this is interesting. Okay, so we've got a bit, a thin line of desaturation. Oh, and it thickens up down here. Okay. Down there. And then there's a stronger one and it's not on the edge. It's just inward from the edge. There we go. I'm going to use the 61. I was just debating between the 63 and the 61. I'm going to use the 61. So I'm coloring over the top of the violet and just a little bit fatter than the violet. So I now have some areas that are green with violet underneath and some areas that are just green. I'm trying to get my stem to look a consistent thickness all the way down. That's another thing I will fix in the digital stamp. All right, so this is the Y11 here, which is one of the few yellows that I work with regularly because it's kind of that buttery yellow. It doesn't have any fluorescence to it. And there we go. So that stem was made with violet, green, and then yellow over the top of it. Now I'm back with that 61. And the Y11. Coming up into those petals and I'll come up even more with the colored pencil but this is just kind of getting the ball rolling Okay, it's a pretty good start. Okay, 
So now I need to do that leaf. I think I'll do this one first. There's a twist in the leaf. I got the 63. Feeling a little chicken about the 67. That just looks too dark for me. So I think I'm gonna pick up this color in colored pencil. So I want this color. I just don't want to do it with the marker. I want to be able to control how much color goes down. If you've never used um, the YG60s, they're not the nicest blending combination here. Um, they they don't really want to blend with each other. The 63 or the 61 here has a lot of solvent in it, and this is a um, combination ink. It has a little bit of blue in it, it has a little bit of green in it, and it has a little bit of yellow in it. And so what's happening here, can you see how the blue tones are starting to come out because of the solvent in the 61. So they're not the friendliest blenders. Like people always think they did something wrong to it. I like the fact that the colors leak out though. That's called shattering. And it's just when you start to break the leaf up into its component colors, or not the leaf, the ink up into its component colors. It's looking a little yellow stronger than I wanted it. So just a little bit of 61 over the top of that again. There we go. That's where I want it to be. And it looks very painterly because of that separation of the inks there. There's a definite blue cast there. It's kind of like the fluorescent pink that's leaking out up there. It's just these little bursts of color that are unplanned, but they're pretty. I don't know that that's pretty, but this is pretty. I think a lot of times as colors, we put down the color and we want it to stay exactly how we did it. And it takes the spontaneity out of your coloring. You gotta leave room for those little accidents to happen. And when they happen, you need to not panic. You need to kind of roll with it. And then hit it with that yellow to warm it up. Now there's a little bit of teal coming out there. That's cool. I like that. All right. to move my photo reference here a bit. Okay. So 
so. letting my eye travel up the leaf I'm coming up here to this other end and my flick strokes are running in the same direction as the veins on this leaf and then that way, if for some reason they don't melt out, they still look pretty. And as a matter of fact, sometimes they look so pretty that I don't melt them out. Because if you look at that leaf, it's not perfectly smooth. So if I blend it perfectly smooth, it's going to take on that plastic kind of look to it. Darn it, I had a really good end there and I bobbled it. Time to grow the shape a little bit. Okay. Just finding those darks. I'm kind of on the side of my nib here, soaking paper or soaking ink into the paper. Now with that Y11, and I left this area here, there's a little extra bit of sun there.
that's the violet. Did not want that. Double check. So I'm back with that 61. That's why I'm having trouble. Okay, YG61. I have the wrong cap on my marker. That's why I grabbed it. I wondered why I grabbed the violet. So I had the wrong cap on it. All right, I think that's going to be it for my Copic there. All right, colored pencil. Set this off to the side for a second. I'm gathering my supplies here. So I know that I want, it's between the dark purple and the violet. I think I'm going violet. Yeah. And then I want this Parma violet as well. So this is Derwent Lightfast Violet. And this is uh, Parma Violet 1008. Um, I don't think I'll grab the gray la grayed lavender. I usually use that a lot, but I think everything is a little dark for it. Oh, I'll pull it out just in case. I may need it in the white area at the bottom of the petal. I want um, either deco yellow or cream. I don't know which yet for the sunshine on the petals. One of those two, not sure which. Um, let's do a magenta pencil. I don't know, um, magenta or process red. I'm thinking process red. And I might pull out warm pink looking to see if I've got any colored pencils off to the side um I might pull out deco pink here I don't know if I'll use it Prussian green do I have a Prussian green in here that's that one grass green Nope. oh here's the Prussian Yeah, I might pick up another green or so, but I don't know yet. We'll just have to go ahead and see. All right, so I'm going to start with those leaves. Kind of knock those out of the way. All right, so right there is where the stem kind of inserts back behind the leaf here.
Okay, so Carla's asking a really good question. She is asking, why did I choose the Derwent Violet and not Indigo? Um, okay, so when I'm looking at the leaves, I see Indigo there. So it would make sense to color the leaves with Indigo, but I'm not going to be putting Indigo into my flower blossom here and to me this is the this takes precedence over what I see here I can get more artistic with the leaves and people will still believe that they're leaves so that's why but if I'm just solely looking at the photograph yeah I do see hints of indigo here actually in the photograph um, but I try and minimize the supply list so that everything feels a little more cohesive. So this is Prussian green and I'm trying to clean up the edge of that stem right up there. I've got the violet down there as the shadiness, the desaturation, um, and then I'm kind of cleaning up my edges with the Prussian green. And now with that Prussian green, I'm bringing some of that stem green up into the shade there. And we need to see the deco yellow just to soften that a bit. And you can knock it back. It feels a little bit strong, but at the same time, I almost want to put a little bit of violet right down in there as the shade. Okay, so I've got, remember how I drew that oval right there? I'm trying to get rid of the top edge of that oval so that it all looks like one unit. So it just looks like one continuous piece moving up there. So I'm pulling back on my pencil so that I'm not pressing too hard. Bringing that green up, that center fold. Just adding a little bit of desaturation. like so. Get that process red and it's going to mimic the RV55. And that's why I didn't do this with the Copic because that tip right there is so much thinner than the Copic 
tip. little fiddly areas here and I'll just finish them off so that I don't have to worry about them. And there we go. That's kind of the back side there. I need to condense it up a little bit, but it's too late for that now. When I'm drawing stamps on my own, I spend a lot of time measuring things like I'll you know, kind of do this where I'll measure how deep something is. And what right now is my eye is telling me that the distance to the from the bottom of the bulb to the top edge of the stem right there, that needs to be about half of what it is. It's too deep. So my pushing at the bottom of these petals is going to be with the green because it's related to the green of the stem. But as I get higher up, I'm going to be switching to the violet. And I'm not doing sunshine here, I'm doing just that green leakage. Okay, so in my hand I have magenta, I have the violet, and the parma violet. Move my photo reference there. You know what? I think I do want that process red. No, I can do it with the violet. Okay. All right. So what I'm seeing is kind of this wine color right here in that crease. So I start it and then... Oh, 
outside the lines just a little bit. The color in this crease isn't quite dark enough for me yet, so I'm desaturating it with some green. Back with that Parma. just have to put this up here. Kelly says she can hear the frustration in my voice. Um, yeah, but it's a good kind of frustration. It's kind of that frustration where you're working on a crossword puzzle and you know you know the answer, but you can't quite put your finger on it. And you know you're close and then all of a sudden you know you're not quite close with it. Um, it's just kind of the, the mental part that I enjoy. So yeah, it's kind of frustrating, but at the same time, it's a good kind of frustration. All right, so I need to find my white pencil. And I'm not sure which one I'm gonna use yet. Start with the Prismacolor white. Very little.
kind of looking at my image here, looking at the one that's on the screen, and then I'm looking up at your version because that's providing me three different versions. The one on, on camera is a lot more fluorescent than it is in real life. So this is definitely one that you're going to want to um, head over to the resource page and I'll put a scan of this so you can see that it's not, it's not as violently pink as it does seem on camera. Then again, maybe you like the violent pink, so. <laughs> All right. Adjusting my view there. Okay. So there's a quite a bit of Parma here comes right down like that. And then there's Parma on that edge. And I really do when I'm working through it in my head, I really do think there's Parma there, there's Violet here. Um, after you, that's one of the reasons why I really recommend that you work with a small set of pencils. It doesn't mean that you don't own the big set. It means that you work with the same pencils until you start thinking in that language. So that when you are sitting in a restaurant and you look over the woman next to you, you don't think that's a purple sweater. You think that's a Parma sweater. That's really the way that you need to start thinking about your colors. And that will never happen if you're constantly bouncing around from brand to brand and, um, moving pencils in and out of the rotation just based on the projects that you're using. You really need to get used to those colors and get to know them in and out and think in that language.
kind of comparing back and forth. I'm missing this area in here. Oh, and this edge goes darker right there. Wow, this is pretty wild on the, <laughs> pretty neon up there. <laughs> okay. I'm going to rearrange my screen here so that I've got a better view of that, this petal. All right, so see a line right there. And if I don't save it right now, I could plow over it later. comes the Parma.
So I'm always coloring softly enough so that the Copic still shines through. So even though I'm using Parma or violet or green, the pencil is so light that the pink underneath is still shining through and it doesn't feel like I just colored something green. It feels like I colored it dirty. Okay, magenta, I need to move my reference up just a little bit. And I'm actually on the stem. Bringing that pink down Mm, I don't love that. So that's the danger of using white as a highlight sometimes is what happened is the white went down and it was immediately way too cool. and cool things recede. So here's that cream. That's better. I could fuss over this stem for a long time. All right. There's like this backlight on this leaf. And I want this part of the leaf to kind of blend in with the paper there.
So see what I mean about the leaves feel like they belong to the pink flower because I've got the blossom color in the leaf and the leaf color in the blossom. So if you were to cut with a pair of scissors and just cut out this leaf and stick it on an orange flower, it shouldn't look like it works. something will be off and it should trigger that this doesn't look right because it belongs to a different flower. You want to color things, the leaves, in a way that they could only belong to that tulip and that tulip only. which really should put to rest the myth that there's a tulip technique because the technique that I use on a different tulip photo reference could be totally different. And I know it would be nice if everything had a specific technique, a, a nice tutorial that went with everything. But as soon as you change the photo reference, you're changing the lighting, the color, you're changing everything about it. So realism is really, you're working on a case by case basis. Deco pink. I'm trying to give this leaf Yeah, that's not working. I'm trying to give it a stronger pink vibe right here where it's very close to the petal. Probably get more. There, I like that. Okay. Let's see this little white edge right there, so I'm reserving it. And then right there. I want the perma.
There we go. Sorry, I'm not very talkative, but you can tell I'm concentrating. Because you kind of have to move into that part of your brain that doesn't think with words. Hmm. I don't think else there's anything else I want to do on this. Okay, let's be brave. All right, so the photo does not have a cast shadow. But I can tell from this white edge here and the white edge here that I do have a bit of light moving in this direction. And I don't think it's going this direction because it's cat it's catching right here so it's got to be moving in this direction which puts the stem cast shadow here So I'm just starting with what, this is another puzzle, and I'm knocking out the things that I feel like I understand. So I'm projecting the light this way and I'm deciding how it's hitting this leaf.
Just working really, really lightly at first. Okay. No, that wouldn't be there. It'd be up here. Sorry, trying to push it away to see it from a distance. I do a lot of rolling back to check things. So under normal circumstances, I would never be sitting at my desk this long. Because I stand up, I look at it from different directions. By the way, this is slate grade 936. I don't think I mentioned that. It's my go-to shadow color when I don't want to have to think very hard. So I'm going to be finishing up on this and now would be a great time if you have questions to throw them in the comment section there. I fear I may have lost people for not talking my way through this, but this was a challenge. So I'm adding the color of the item, casting the shadow is what I'm doing. 
So if the shadow is cast by a pink object, then there is pink in the shadow. And if the shadow is cast by a green object, I'm getting lime peel 1005, and that's going to duplicate that green feeling. So shadows cast by green things are slightly green. As long as the shadow is being cast onto a white surface. This wouldn't be totally true if the background was pink or yellow or something. And now I'm coming in and putting a little bit of extra slate right where the shadow touches or intersects with the object. It's not actually touching the object, but right where the shadow is starting to intersect with the leaf. I've noticed that um, people leave like little these, these little halos of white before the shadow starts and so ever since I noticed that um, I've always gone out of my way to make sure that I tuck everything nicely in around the object and then I tell you that I'm doing it and why I'm doing it so that you don't make that mistake I don't know why I think people are just hesitant to touch have the shadow touch the, the object completely and then there's also the fact that when you trace sometimes you get a little tunnel um, like a little divot where the pencil lead was and you have to make sure to fill that in Not too bad and I guess I'm not I'm not totally bummed like before I thought the stem needed to be a lot longer but now as I'm like looking at it next to the photo reference up there it is a little longer and a little more graceful maybe it needs to come down and connect down here and then have this come out lower I'll have to play with it when I'm redrawing It'd be nice if I could just throw this into the computer, like scan it, and then have the computer make a stamp out of it. So there we go. That is the tulip. Okay, so I am going to grab the questions. I'm going to scroll up to the top, make sure that I don't miss anything. Okay. Kelly says, Prismas are the only pencils I'm able to identify mostly on. Um, yeah, and it's probably because they're the ones that you use the most that you can identify those on site. Um, and that's a good thing. 
you should be looking at something and saying that is, and I, I'm terrible about holding numbers in my head. So it was really hard for me to get used to Copic because Copic, I mean, like nobody, I, you couldn't pay me to tell you what some of these names are. Y11 is pale yellow. I didn't know that. Um, most you can always tell that somebody doesn't really know Copic when they start referring to things by their color names because everybody that I know refers to them by the numbers. So it was hard for me to start memorizing numbers because I don't hold numbers in my head very well. It took a long time for me to start thinking of like when I look at the grass that that's YG67 or it's YG17. Um, that took me longer. With Prismacolor, I don't know anybody that knows them by the numbers. The only numbers that I do know are just the ones that I use all the time and I put them in packets constantly. We know these guys and paint is the same way. Most people know paint by the name, not the number. Um, but you really do need to get to the point where you're starting to identify these colors in the world around you so that you know when to start using them because you can draw on your history and say, oh, I'm coloring a daffodil and I've seen lime peel in daffodil petals before. So you have to get to that point where you're super comfortable with the colors to be able to think that way. And Kenny says, it's realistic, it's stunning. Thank you very much. And there's always things that I would correct about it, but um, it's not too bad. Like, I really want a little bit more paper there. <laughs> but that was my fault for not mapping it out properly. I should have spent longer just, you know, with a ruler. So Sheila's asking, when will this start looking realistic? After the use of solvent? And then she says, oh, I, re I see now not realistic, not photorealistic. Um, so I guess we have to define our terms there. This is colored pencil. It is always going to look a little gritty and grainy unless you go in there and smush it around with solvent. And I'm very big on not using solvent because the um, Colored Pencil Society and um, the Blue Will measurements, all of that stuff that they've done to determine that this is a light fast pencil has not been done with the use of solvents. When you add solvents, you're breaking down the integrity of your colored pencil. So I started in a time when colored pencil wasn't really considered an art form and I had never heard of solvent until a long time after doing it. Um, and I find solvent frustrating that you put it down and then you immediately lose some of your color and then you're smushing it around and then you can't tell that it was done with colored pencil. So I'm just kind of I don't think it's a secure way to color. And that's having said this, knowing that Prismacolor are not totally light fast. I understand. But when you break it down, you're losing some of that integrity. The wax has a purpose there. And when you rub that wax away, you're rubbing away some of the protectant. But the other thing is you're rubbing away your artistic fingerprints. And I don't know. I, if you're standing back on this, it does look photorealistic. So I guess we have to quibble with how much texture is allowed in colored pencil. And to me, that's kind of like quibbling with somebody who's an impressionist and how many brush strokes are they allowed to use? So it's all according to taste. And if you really want that smooth kind of look, I would suggest that maybe you're in the wrong art field, that oil paints are probably more to your liking because that's what the solvent is supposed to make the colored pencil look more like oil paints. Um, I'm kind of celebrating the pencils for what they are. So I don't know if it's totally translating on camera, but I'm leaving texture marks here. I've got flick marks. I've got strokes here showing. And I like that 
because it's telling you that Amy did this. This is not a photograph. But yet it does, when you stand back on it, have a certain amount of realism to it. So it's just, you know, and we can agree to disagree on it. I just, I don't know. I To me, that's looking pretty darn realistic. And if I were to put solvent over the top of it, I'm not sure if it would have more depth or more dimension or more realism. It would definitely have fewer of my signature moves on it, though. It would be less mine if I were to smush all of that around. Carla says, it is heartening to see you struggle a bit with the shadow. That is one of the hardest things for me, and I'm glad you're not using the gray markers anymore. <laughs> okay, so the gray marker thing, um, we were doing kick out shadows because that was like an intermediate level thing. I would never ask a beginner or an intermediate to do those, um, what it was, and, and I won't do it, but usually it was with a very light marker, and then you do these flick strokes that move out. And I try and made, make those make sense, but they are kind of um, difficult to melt out on the inside in. So what I'm talking about is, okay, so you might have a leaf here like so, and then I will have some beginner students butt their marker right up to the side of it and flick out. And that works really nicely if you have a good flick stroke and um, then you can come in with a zero. And come in this reverse direction to melt out those points even more. It works and it's actually a really good um, exercise for people, but that's not necessarily how I do things in my own personal work. So it's not that I don't do them anymore. It's that, that this isn't like, I'm trying to do realism here. So I'm not going to do just a generic kick out like that. Oh, I got something on there. No matter what, I always end up mucking them up somehow, which is why I'm very glad for Photoshop to be able to come in and erase little dots like that in the margin. <laughs> Jody says, love seeing your process and how it gets such dimension. It's just patience. And I've seen Jody do some really cool stuff too. So I know that you've got the patience for it. Um, and if you have the time to just sit there and work at it. But it's, I mean, what, we're going on almost... Yeah, just a little over two hours. So these aren't projects that you can just, you know, kick out in 15 minutes. So Carla says, I also struggle with the level of detail. How much is too much um, and how much is enough? That's a really good question. So I don't know if you were able to see it, but because it's hard with my glasses on um, and the computer reflecting onto my lenses here. But I do a lot of squinting. And so I will squint, like right now I'm squinting at the full-size tulip reference that I have in front of me. Um, and if I can see it on the squint, then it is important enough to put it in here. If I can't see it, unless my nose is like right up next to it, or I have to zoom in, because frequently I, put th I will put things on my iPad. My, I've got an iPad Pro, and I'll put it on there. Um... And if I have to zoom in on it, then it's probably not important enough. So anything that you automatically see on the squint goes in. That's not even a debate. And then if you only see it when you are focused on it or when you're zoomed in, then those are the things that you need to debate about. Now, there's a lot of details that I have not put in here. Um... And I do make corrections. So like, let me see, where's that tulip large? There we go. So if you follow the left leaf or the left petal up, see how there's like a dot? There's like a, I don't know if that's something that was on the plant itself, like that's a little flaw 
or if it's something that made it through the Photoshop and because it almost looks like like the Photoshop uh, dodge tool. So I'm not sure if that's a mistake or what, but I didn't put that in there. Anything that people would question, like, what is that? Definitely doesn't go in. And I'll correct the shapes on things. Um, but that's just the kind of things that I was taught to do for technical illustration, where you're always making something look as clear as it should, as it can possibly look for educational purposes. You don't want somebody questioning um, how many petals are there or where something is connected. You want to make things as clear and as readable as possible. So part of that's just the background there. Oh, Jackie says it needs a lace cloth underneath it. Yes, but then that would be like a 10 hour live stream. So <laughs> I don't know that I will be doing that on this one, but I look forward to seeing yours. <laughs> okay, so Gina is asking, she says, I struggle to find where to start with underpainting. So um, all of my classes involve underpainting and I really believe that it should be introduced to you as a beginner, like as if that's the only way that you know to color, um, because it's the only way that I know to see color. Um, so, um, I'm trying to think. B60, I would start with that marker. Where is it? Where are you? we go. B60 is this innocent little blue. So that's what B60 looks like just all by itself. But you can give yourself two coats and look how that has a little bit more punch. And then this one has a little bit more punch. So by starting with a little tiny marker like this that doesn't have a lot of color to it, and just learning to add a little bit in here or a little bit in here and just doing it gradually. Your natural inclination though should be, ew, that doesn't look right. Underpainting is kind of an acquired taste because I think so many card makers and crafters are used to using these pure saturated colors. So as soon as you make something look muddy and ugly, um, the natural inclination should be to say, ooh, but then the more you use it and the more you see it, and then the more you start seeing it around the world, you know, in the rooms around you, and you start looking at shadows and looking at shade and looking at it more carefully, you're going to see more and more color. But I would start with just a very faint, delicate blue. And when I'm starting beginners, I always start them with, um, this combination right here. Sometimes it's B23, sometimes it's B32. But if we're doing a leaf, I always start people with blue because it's an easier thing to accept is seeing that blue underneath the green where it's much harder if I were to start you like with a green marker underneath a pink marker. So I would just start with blue and just gradually add a little bit more murkiness to your projects little by little. This is hammer mill, so it's not gonna blend no matter how hard I try. I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> I have too much of it. So Kelly says solvent, solvent would ruin the Amy style. It, it, it's because it's not a product that I use. So yeah, and I've, I've learned to add things and I've learned, I think if you learn without solvent, you will have better blending skills than if you rely on solvent to do it for you. And the other thing is, is that most of the time when people are using solvent, they are working on paper that's a little too toothy for colored pencil. So, but I put the Copic below to fill in the tooth. So I'm cheating that way too. So, you know, I'm, I, I just, it doesn't work for me. I, I don't like it, but 
I don't object to other people using it, I guess. And I've seen some really beautiful stuff that has been, you know, wiped with solvent. So Lin Linda says, it's beautiful. It wouldn't change a thing. My first solo pencil drawing was a tulip and I still have it. So I guess I have a soft spot for them. You know what? I think if you were, if you were in an art class, then that was a very smart art teacher. I've heard a lot of art teachers telling me, that they start students on roses. And I think that's like dropping you into the deep end of a pool without any help. Tulips are just a nice compact shape. There's only six, yeah, there's six petals. So there's not a lot there to deal with. And you've got that really nice bowl so that if you're looking into, into the bowl of a tulip, you can start to add the shade that's in that bowl or you can start to get the roundness. There's just a lot of really good shape to it. So Linda, if that was an art teacher that introduced you to tulips first, that was a good art teacher. I think that was a smart decision there. I can't remember what my first flower was. I know I did corn on the cob really, really early. So that should have just told me right there that I was meant to do food illustration and stuff. Um, Nancy is asking, what sort of things do you draw for technical illustration? Well, I did a lot of, um, uh, medical stuff. So not super interesting. Um, just educational materials that go into the side of books and stuff. So that's mostly what I ended up doing, but I worked for a hospital. So what else are you going to draw? Jody asked, you used violets and purples and the white Prisma color. If I remember, doesn't the white on purple make a funky color or was it a different combo? So Jody is asking about the fact that I was using this violet pencil and then I was using white over the top of it. And I can do that because I'm using the Derwent Light Fast. Um, I'm trying to see, dark purple, where is it? So this is Prismacolor Dark Purple, and Jody used to take my local classes, so she definitely heard me talk about that. So here's the Derwent, or no, this is the Pr Prismacolor Dark Purple. So Prismacolor Dark Purple. And then here is the Derwent Purple. Boy, this is going to be confusing. And then here's the Derwent Violet. And it happens with anything white, whether it's colored pencil, but it happens super fast with Posca. So I'm just doing a white Posca heart over the top of these pencils. And you can already see what's happening there. See how that's turning white? So this is the danger that, that Jody was asking about. It doesn't happen with these Derwent Light Fasts. And so I don't really... I have the whole set of Derwent Light Fast and I, these are the really, I've got like a handful of colors that I use, just mostly these two pencils though. And it's because of this right here. So I switched and I wish that Derwent made a color that was exactly like this one. So when I'm working on something that needs something a little cooler, I tend to use the violet. And when I'm working on something a little warmer, then I use the purple. I wish I could find that happy medium color that's in between. And these are both transparent, just like this one is. So when you use them on black, you can't see the color at all. But it's that pink reaction that I'm trying to avoid. And so in the classes that Jody took, I was always telling students, okay, because we didn't have these guys back then. Um, so I was always telling students, don't get the white too close. But now that I've switched to Derwent, I can do that.
Carlos says, um, I love succulents. I would love to see something blue green either here or in color wonk. Um, actually I'm sitting on a, um, succulent stamp right now. And I was trying to decide whether to release it as a class or release it as a, um, digital stamp. It's too big for color wonk. It's got too many things going on in it. Those are always five by five projects. Um, but maybe I could take part of it. I don't want to do too many flowers in a row. So it would be a couple of months before we got to it. But yeah, succulents are something that I do frequently. And um, I can work those into color wonk for you. Kenny says, thank you so much for streaming. I'm sorry, but I have to go. See you next time. Bye, everyone. Yep. <laughs> I know these are long and in the evening. So, um, yep. And I'm ready for bed, too. So, okay. I will wait just a few more minutes if there's any other questions there. But other than that, um, I think we'll just kind of wind it up. And um, do, 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 do. let's see. Next month... The second Tuesday of the month, I got to move to May here. Second Tuesday of the month will be, ooh, May 14th. So this is a little bit late in there and it's coming in after Mother's Day. Um, I'm not sure what I will be drawing for that one, but um, hmm, I have to think about that. But May 14th would be the next drawing color session here on YouTube. And um there's always Color Wonk for the Intermediates. That's a monthly challenge that starts on the first of the month. And then um, uh, Under Painters is the same thing for advanced students. And that one always starts on the first of the month as well. And those are membership things. So um, it's kind of like as if I was at Patreon, but only without all the hassle of Patreon. Because I used to be on Patreon, but... Um, we left there and have been very happy not being there anymore. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So if you're interested in the monthly lessons, uh, every month we have a new challenge image. And then there is a private live stream just for that class um, that demonstrates key points of the project for underpainters, the advanced. And it'll walk you through the whole entire project for um, the intermediates. So, um and here's an example of this is what we're working on this month in Color Wonk. So we will be live streaming this on Friday for their um, membership only live stream. And it's another lesson on pink. And this is why I'm so sick of pink. <laughs> All right. So there's that tulip that we did tonight. There's that Color Wonk project. Um, and uh, yeah. Double checking to make sure there's no... Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Nancy's asking, when is the color wonk video? So the live stream is this Friday. Um, that kicks off at 1 PM Eastern time zone for me. Um, and that'll be the live demonstration of the, um, I lost it of the cherry blossom. And then this Friday, there will also be a free video on YouTube that'll talk about pink a little bit more. So yeah. I'm all pinked out. Um, so yeah, watch for that to happen at 1 p.m. on Friday as well. So there we go. That is the rest of the week. And I will see everybody in the private groups or um, in the comment section here at YouTube. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening and happy coloring. <laughs>